We begin with a story from the world of agriculture with an update from our favorite field of research, genetically engineered crops. And this isn't even scary engineering like building in pesticides or changing the nutritional content of a plant. This research done by Cornell is about straight up increasing the efficiency of plants. You see, there are two main types of photosynthesis that plants can perform. A lot of plants, including many crops, perform C3 photosynthesis, which is less efficient. C4 photosynthesis evolved much later in around 60 plants independently, including grass, sugarcane, and maize. The difference relates to the actual anatomy of the leaves and allows C4 plants to handle droughts better and require less nitrogen. In all plants, an enzyme called Rubisco is responsible for capturing carbon dioxide for use in photosynthesis. But in C3 plants, the enzyme also interacts with oxygen, reducing the overall efficiency by 30 to 40 percent. Whereas C4 plants perform this process in two steps. First in the additional outer leaf layer called the mesophyll, and then the carbon dioxide is brought to the bundle sheath cells around the leaf veins. Only the second step involves the enzyme Rubisco, and inside cells with very low amounts of oxygen. Because these bundle sheath cells looked like certain cells inside the roots, researchers examined the genes controlling both of them. Working with strains of maize, they identified a gene that is a key regulator in C4 leaf anatomy, dubbed scarecrow. It'll be some time before new C4 crops like wheat and rice are engineered, but it's an important first step, one that could lead to a 50% increase in yields, even in harsher conditions. Next is an update from the world of biotechnology. A group from the University of Minnesota have found a way of culturing a tricky and potentially useful bacteria. Particularly, iron oxidizing bacteria which use dissolved iron as a primary component in their respiration. Now these sorts of bacteria can be found all over the place, usually where a low oxygen environment interacts with a high oxygen environment. Sometimes they're beneficial, helping iron cycle through an environment, or damaging, adding to the corrosion of steel pipes due to a byproduct of their metabolism being rust. Because of all this, they've been extremely difficult to culture in a lab. Since scientists think the actual oxidation step happens on the cell membrane, a simple solution was discovered, feeding the bacteria straight electrons. First, it was just attempting to grow the bacteria on an electrode with a growth medium, but eventually they removed the iron from the medium and demonstrated the bacteria could grow with just electricity. This is important not only for research, but it could have some serious practical applications. Since these bacteria can live off essentially just electrons, they could be made into a kind of reverse bioreactor, converting electricity from sources like wind and solar into biological molecules to be used as fuel. Although such energy storage technology is far off, this is an important first step. Our top story comes from the world of biology. Last week, we talked about a virus stealing the immune system from a bacteria, and this week we're actually continuing that theme. An international team of scientists was studying an extremophile species of red algae and made some interesting discoveries. It can be found in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park, and besides some heat tolerance, it's a pretty normal algae, using the sun's energy to create sugar through photosynthesis. However, if this microorganism finds itself in the drainage system of an old mine shaft, it becomes a total badass. Without sunlight, it begins feeding off of nearby bacteria, among other food sources, while tolerating conditions as caustic as battery acid. Now, organisms that can tolerate conditions like this aren't news, such as the other microbes that the algae feed upon when conditions get tough. It's the fact that extremophiles are usually specialists, whereas this red algae seems to be fine with a range of extreme conditions. Even more interesting is how the algae evolved these abilities. If you were paying attention to the beginning of the segment, you may have guessed that the algae stole them. It's called lateral gene transfer, and it's pretty common among bacteria and archaea, but almost unheard of in eukaryotes, organisms with a nucleus. But in the genome of this eukaryotic algae were toxin pump proteins from bacteria, heat tolerance genes from archaea, and other examples of lateral gene transfer. Figuring out how this algae stole the genes from other microbes and so successfully integrated them could be extremely helpful for biotechnology, allowing scientists to develop a similar way of engineering eukaryotic organisms from algae to produce biofuels as well as multicellular plants and animals, including maybe humans.
If you read the title, you can probably guess our top story comes from the world of biotechnology. Some scientists over at Princeton have made a bionic ear using 3D printing. Now the term bionic is somewhat vague, but it generally refers to the integration of electronics and biology. The fact that this ear is 3D printed is just the icing on the nerdy tech cake. Growing a new ear in general is already a complicated process, but the scientists found that 3D printing cells is a very convenient way to do it. This was done using essentially off-the-shelf 3D printing hardware, which means it has implications for non-bionic ear replacement as well. However, this isn't the first time 3D printing has been applied to tissues and organs, but this is the first time it's been applied to bionic organs. By the way, the bionic part of this ear is a coiled-up antenna within the cartilage that allows it to pick up radio signals. Obviously, this first organ was just a proof of principle and won't be transplanted onto a human anytime soon. The 3D printer was loaded with three primary substances, a hydrogel polymer often used for organ and tissue scaffolding, cow cells that eventually became cartilage, and silver nanoparticles that were laced throughout the structure and became the antenna. The final product had two wires coming out of the base toward a helical structure that replicated the human cochlea the organ responsible for actually translating sound into nerve impulses. In the future, this could be integrated with or replace a human cochlear to enhance or substitute hearing. Next for the scientists is integrating pressure and vibration sensors into a bionic ear so it could also perceive normal sound. It may be a while to fully develop, but it's still exciting news for the hearing impaired and transhumanists alike. And how they created this bionic ear is a good model for future integration of biology and electronics. Our first story comes from the world of biotechnology. Here on Brainstorm, we've discussed one aspect of synthetic biology in particular, which is the creation of circuits inside living cells. Rather than circuits of transistors and electricity, these circuits are governed by the interaction of genes, their protein products, and often the cellular environment. Generally speaking, the goal is to use genetics to create a digital circuit, but some engineers over at MIT have taken a different approach and created analog circuits within a cell. These circuits operate with a range of potential values. Current and voltage in electronic circuits and various concentrations of molecules in the case of biology. They found it much simpler to engineer analog circuits because it's closer to how many biological reactions are regulated in the first place. This research actually began in the opposite direction, when eight analog electronic transistors were successfully used to model a DNA protein interaction. With this knowledge, they created several circuits that perform mathematical calculations within a cell in response to multiple inputs. Addition and multiplication is achieved when sensors within the cell react to different concentrations of a substance and collectively promote the expression of a green fluorescent protein. In this case, allowing for the direct visual observation of the combined concentrations of a particular sugar and another signaling molecule. Similarly, subtraction and division can be achieved if one compound triggers a gene promoter and another triggers the gene suppressor. They even created an analog square rooting circuit using only two genetic parts, whereas a recent digital circuit required over 100 genetic parts. Still, this is only the beginning for analog genetic circuits, with the goal of making advanced and precise biologically based sensors, both for the environment and enhance control over gene expression in organisms. Next is attempting to build such circuits in non-bacteria cells and modifying other cellular parts to work in a wider range of concentrations.